Hello and welcome to Philosophy Roulette. This is number 209 where I read and review philosophy papers live on air. My apologies for not being around the last few weeks if for whoever was watching or wondering where I had gotten myself to, but back on the front page of uh, the philosophical internet right here. It's just, I don't know if you can see behind me, it's a bit of a mess, the uh, place I am at. We had some uh, painting getting done and so uh, things were upheaval like upheaved go take a look at what's in our kentness the european journal of philosophy the japa so let's see what we got probably ho hopefully some new stuff because what happens is uh <laughs> there's lulls in the um didn't i just read this levels of organization I read something on that there's lulls in uh publications of philosophy so like i end up reading everything that i uh of a reasonable length. So let's see if I got my, uh, there we go. Oh no, I read this. There's nothing new. So, Charma's argument from relativity. I read that a, a long time ago. But wait a sec, maybe uh, if I can recall correctly, or Kentness, all the new stuff, is that it at the bottom or is it just me? Um, I don't remember. The support interval. Did I read anything like that? A frequent. A frequentist confidence interval can be constructed by in inverting a hypothesis test, such that the interval contains only param param parameter values that would not have been rejected by the test. We show how a similar definition can be employed to construct a Bayesian support interval consistent with Carnap's theory of corroboration. The support. Yeah, this is going to be a lot of math in terms. I don't know. Is How does this happen? Must It must be. Powerful problems for powerful qualities. Hmm. The powerful quant qualities view of properties is currently enjoying a surge in popularity. Recently, I have argued that the standard version of the view is no different from a rival view, the pure powers position. I have also argued that the canonical version of the powerful qualities, qualities view faces the same problem as the pure powers view. The dreaded regress objection. Joaquin Gianotto disagrees. Okay, so we're talking about the uh, powers and whatnots. Interesting. Uh, so we got two copies there of the same paper. Uh, I could read that. Come back, see what's in some of the other journals. A justification for the quantificational. I think it, I read this one, so I must have gotten through most of these. All right, so not too much uh, forthcoming from or Kentness. That's odd because they tend to publish a lot. So I would expect there to be a lot of things forthcoming, but whatever. Let's see what we got here at the European Journal of Philosophy. Well, nothing at all, because it's everything is too long. Now we've got the Japa. Let's see. Social Objects, Response, Depends, and Realism by Asya Pasinski. There is a widespread sentiment that social objects such as nation states, borders, and pieces of money are just figments of our collective imagination and not really out there in the world. This is called the anti-realist intuition. Eliminativists, reductive materialist, and, Im and immaterialist views of social objects can all make sense of the anti-realist intuition in one way or another. But these views say, face serious difficulties. A promising alternative view is non-reductive materialism. It is unclear whether and how non-reductive materialism. I don't know. Maybe I'll come back to that. That's the only thing on this page. Okay, so. Nietzsche, metaphysician. But no page number, so I can't do anything about it. Alright, so let's just see what else we've got on the... Uh, let's get always go back to our Kentness. They had a few. Uh, Pacific Philosophical Quarterly, Philosophia. These are good journals. Let's see what is coming out. And of course, you are free to suggest papers for me to read. I read towards a hybrid account of luck, I believe. I see not only Madonna, but also a hole in the picture. Wow. I mean, Madonna doesn't. They generally not holes in pictures of Madonna, so that's kind of interesting. Knowledge and Truth, a skeptical challenge. I feel like I've read this. Yeah, I did read that. All right, so that means I've already gotten to all of these, but I don't know what this hole in a picture is. I kind of want to know what that hole is. Where is the hole in? Is it holy? Like, the Madonna is kind of holy. Um, 
not whole, but holy. Let's see if the uh, PDF shows up right here. Maybe I'll do that because I haven't read any aesthetics in a while. The novel as a perform performing art. Okay, so that's also aesthetics. Let's see what else we got. That's kind of a long paper. One to five. Interpretism without judgment dependence. Hmm. Don't know what that means. Reparations, responsibility, and formalism resp reply to Karns. Let's, let's go back. Interpretivism without judgment dependence. Let's see if that's there. And if is my internet not working? I says my internet's working. Maybe this just doesn't want to load this paper. Uh, something's loading. Well, this one's available. So what one is this? This is the interpretivism from Philosophia. Is this available or is this website just not being friendly? This website's just not being friendly because this loads just fine. And I'm, it's kind of hard to fight with a one to five. So probably is what we're going to do now. We're going to do interpretivism without judgment dependence, although I'm kind of annoyed that this isn't showing up. Oh. We are not allowed to display external PDFs. Come on, load, would you? But yeah, maybe I'll do that next. Well, I'll give them another three seconds to download. Oh, okay, there's 16 pages and, but it has pictures. I love pictures, but it's 16 pages in single space and that scares me. So we're gonna read this, that's five pages, but does it have pictures? Why do you not have pictures? You should have pictures. But we're gonna read this one anyway, because we can. Uh, no pictures, it makes me sad. Okay, let's see. So that's this one for those watching live. There's the uh, link in the chat. If you come a little later, you can always type exclamation point paper in the chat box and it will pop back up. Um, alternatively, if you're watching on like a later date on the YouTubes or whatever's, um, it'll be in the, the link will be in the show notes below. So. There we go. Okay, so we're reading Interpretivism Without Judgment Dependence by Devin Sanchez Curry, and I apologize for how I say everyone's names because, well, it's just not what I'm good at. Wait, is this, uh, let me see something real quick. My chat box not moving? Oh, huh, it is real interesting. Chat's not updating in real time. But, let me just double check that. There we go. Because I mean, I'm just window capturing for those who care about such things. It just was, it was updating a little bit, but not other stuff. Anywho, okay, so here we go. Interpretivists about a mental phenomenon hold that it emerges only in relation to an interpretive activity, capacity, or scheme. For instance, interpretivism about belief is the view that to believe is to be aptly interpretable as believing. Not because what somebody believes is necessarily epistemic accessible, but because an interpreter renders them a believer in the first place. Christoph uh, Postlyko, forthcoming, and I apologize how I say your name, has approvingly reconstructed Alex Burns' dilemma for interpretivism about belief and other so-called propositional attitudes. I will argue that due reflection on recent work on folk psychology undermines that dilemma. Okay, so this is kind of interesting already. I mean, we've got folk psychology undermining a dilemma that's kind of an interesting sort of way to go about stuff so it's going to be an interesting argument i think on the first one of burns dilemma the interpretivist takes attitudes to emerge relative to an interpreter an ideal interpreter oh dear ideal interpreters are so scary no one knows what that means 
On the second horn, the interpretivist takes attitudes to emerge relative to an individual's judgments. Pozlaiko or- argues that both horns are unacceptably pointy. <laughs> well, what else are horns supposed to be? They have to be pointy. In the end, as Byrne correctly observes, the interpretivist must either idealize the interpreter to the point at which he loses any connection to the actual subjects who are engaged in real-life interpretation pro- interpretation processes, or he must deny the possibility of errors in the attribution of mental states. To be an attractive metaphysics of the objects of folk psychology, interpretivism must relativize them to an actual to actual folk psychological practices. But Byrne and Pozlakio contend that, in doing so, the interpretivist must commit to an absurdity by giving up on the idea that folks can be wrong about what people believe and desire. So, it's an absurdity that folks can be wrong about what people believe and desire. I mean, of course, so they must say we must have some sort of direct access to uh, what we believe and desire, or it must that must be some sort of necessary... Uh, something necessarily entailed by their position so that is kind of an odd thing if that something so strong and so odd that we all know exactly what we want um were to follow from the position okay Byrne and Pozlaiko are right that both of these horns are unacceptably pointy but wrong that the interpretivist must be speared by one or the other see I guess you could like land in between the horns and just be on like the the bull's nose I don't know Interpretivists can viably reject the notion of an ideal or even canonical interpreter without taking on board the unacceptable epistemological consequences of allowing that attitudes are judgment-dependent. I am an interpretivist about many mental phenomena, including most attitudes, and I've argued that my fellow interpretivists, uh, so this must be Curry, I forget already, um, yeah, I think so. Dan, D- David Sanchez Curry <laughs> and my fellow interpreters Donald Davidson, Daniel Dennett, and Bruno Mulder are wrong to cast attitudes as existing relative to idealized normative standards of attitude description and relatedly to divorce the metaphysics of attitudes from the messy details of actual folk psychological practices. I am not thereby doomed to render attitude judgment attitudes judgment dependent to see why one need look no further than the messy details of actual folk psychological practices what's up to marshall i'm reading a little paper on uh folk psychology and uh what is this the metaphysics of uh how we interpret uh mental attitudes yeah so, you know, this always worries me, though. I mean, I always know, at least for myself, if I ever attempt to get out of my armchair, because I'm like an armchair philosopher, I don't really go anywhere, um, that usually is an indication that I've gone very, very wrong. <laughs> so the idea that we're appealing to actual folk psychological practices makes me nervous. I mean, it's like sometimes, like in the philosophy of science, we appeal to like what physicists actually do, and like why we need to pay attention to them because it is important to know what the physicists are doing if we're talking about the science. But this is interesting to me because we're talking about how we interpret our beliefs. Why do we need as philosophers to look at what psychology says about beliefs or the practices of folk psychology? Does that actually matter on how we interpret things? Why should the folk psychology be normative for us? So that's an something I, I wonder about because there needs to be specific reasons why we do appeal to physics in some cases or psychology in other cases but it shouldn't be applied willy-nilly they don't know all the things like you don't ask the physicists about consciousness it's just they might have something interesting to say but it's like why would that be the right time to ask a physicist that's not their domain i mean you could go ask a neuroscientist or a philosopher of mind I got what you're saying, like Buddhism and stuff. Yeah, that's right. Like, if you go ask somebody about the wrong area, why are you asking? So, okay, continuing. And yeah, if anyone wants to show up and ask questions, please feel free. Like, go right ahead. I'm reading this first time, and you're here with me. (laughs) Looking at those practices, it is plain that there is a distinction to be drawn between how folks conceive of an attitude on the one hand and whether they accurately judge that somebody has an attitude as folks conceive of it on the other. 
All sorts of factors play into a judgment and actual ascription of an attitude to an individual that are irrelevant to the question of how the ascriber conceives of the attitude in question. Perhaps most saliently, ascribers almost always lack complete evidence about whether somebody sufficiently fits their conception to count as having the attitude. Alright, so do we really need to appeal to folk psychology to say that people get um, attitudes wrong? Like we might have one and then we just misascribe it? I mean, sure you can, and it does seem reasonable, but like, is that really a question of folk psychology? It's like that we get ascriptions wrong. Maybe, maybe not, but what extra is being added right there? So this is like the sort of thing that would like, this is why they are appealing to folk psychology and they immediately do, which is just a good practice. So we know what the author is talking about, but I'm like, is that actually necessary? Uh, yeah, I mean, you, it, this is kind of the point. How do we actually, why do we know that one thing is what we're talking about sometimes? It's like we can be wrong about where we're getting our attitudes from. Okay, consider the case of George, who pretends to be an ethical vegetarian in a bid to impress his new boss, Nadia. Having heard George decry the treatment of factory farm animals and having observed him refusing to eat meat on several occasions, Nadia ascribes to George the belief that eating meat is wrong. In doing so, Nadia falsely assumes that George always refrains from eating meat, not just in her company, and that his anti-factory farming remarks were sincere. After all, she conceives of a belief in the wrongness of eating meat as comprising inter alia the propensities to forego burgers and sincerely denounce factory farming. Nadia is making an error in judgment. Her conception of the relevant ethical vegetarian belief is not faulty, but George has tricked her into making a faulty inference about what he is usually like. Um, I don't, I mean, this is sort of just maybe nitpicking here, but I mean, I don't know if she actually made an error in judgment. I mean, he purposefully gave her the wrong evidence, so she was judging correctly given what she, the evidence that was presented to her. But uh, it's just exactly how do we, where where is that error? So, other cases of folk psychological error are easy to conjure. Consider the following Cyclops, who misjudges Polyphemus as believing that nobody has wounded him, when due to Odysseus's trickery, Polyphemus actually believes that somebody named Nobody has wounded him. Yeah, for those who don't know the story, um, I believe it was Odysseus. I haven't. I never read the book, but I was told the story a long time ago. He blinds the Cyclops, Cyclops, but he had fooled the Cyclops into believing his name was Nobody. And so when the other uh, Cyclops were like, well, who did this to you? He says, nobody did this to me. But he thought he was naming, naming the person because that was the name of the guy's Odysseus' name was Nobody. But course they didn't know who to look for because they thought he was just an idiot and had like injured himself because he said no one had done it to him yeah so in that case the other uh cyclops were confused about the they had the they had the belief that nobody had injured um their their friend polypheme um nobody had injured their friend when some when someone at, had actually injured a friend and he was trying to tell them who had done it but because the use of the name was uh getting a uh, mentioned versus used i guess you could say he was mentioning the person's name ver- versus using the term nobody so anyway so, in that case, I think that's a bit closer to uh, actually make a mistake in judgment. Yeah, because it wasn't trying to be fooled. In that case, they were trying to be sincere. Yet other cases involve ascriptions of attitudes other than belief and do not stem from deception. Consider any comedy of errors with a plot driven by the protagonist's honest misunderstanding about what or whom another character desires. Sure. Recent work on the mechanics of folk psychology illuminates what is going on in these cases. According to the model theoretic approaches to folk psychology that have gained traction in recent years, interpreters construct and wield model psychological profiles of people in order to ascribe attitudes and other traits to those people. These models specify what people who have particular attitudes and particular sets of attitudes are like. Although folk psychological models have some nearly universally shared features, the empirical evidence suggests that many of the details of how folk models are Folk model attitudes vary across cultures and subcultures, and perhaps even from interpreter to interpreter. When folks ascribe an attitude, they judge that 
the person who is the target of the ascription sufficiently fits their idiosyncratic model of somebody with an that attitude. The possibility of error arises due to the fact that folks are often mistaken about how well their targets fit their models. Okay, so again, this is all like leaning on this folk psychological evidence in folk psychology. Again, we can just make the claim that people get other people wrong because it's not so clear what an attitude is and what it counts as it. But, uh, yeah, so I mean, I'm with the author, but it, it's just an interesting appeal here, this whole bit that, um, like, trying to show something here, and I'm not sure what exactly. Anyway, let's see. Towards the end of his article, Pozlaiko poses a rhetorical question. What is the sense of the notion of metaphysical dependency that is adopted by the proponent of interpretivism once the idea of judgment dependence in this sense, which requires an actual interpretation to take place, is rejected? Pozlaiko suggests that Mulder has no good answer to this question, but I have a good answer. The proponent of interpretivism can adopt model dependence, which requires an actual interpreter and an actual interpretive scheme without requiring that an actual interpretation take place as the sense in which attitudes are metaphysically dependent on interpretation. To have an attitude is to sufficiently fit a folk psycho psychological model of somebody who has that attitude, whether or not one is accurately judged sufficiently to sufficiently fit that model. Okay, so they're saying is, look, you don't actually need to have a person that has the attitude. You just need to be somebody that could have been that person that fit that attitude. It doesn't even need to be like ideal. It just needs to be somebody that actually does sort of go that way. So, I mean, sufficiently fit. Here's where the uh, work is being done right here. To have an attitude is to sufficiently fit a so like, uh, folk psychological model. So... I don't really know what it means to sufficiently fit anything. Um, is this just the author's opinion about what's good? I don't know. Um, I'm not exactly sure what the psych folk psychological model, because uh, right up here we were saying there, even though they have some universally shared features, there's a lot of variation. But we all do have some sort of understanding of exactly what it is like that when we think someone fits a mold. Um, that we have sort of an understanding of them, that they fit the mold of the person that we think they are. Uh, going back to the Shakespeare, the king is kind. The king is kind. The king is of a type. The king is of a certain type. And uh, who was saying that? I forgot off whose um, soliloquy that was. But the point was they're saying the king is of a certain type. You know the type. And it's not a good kind of person. And that's why it's interesting because we don't use kind anymore in a negative way. But back then, it didn't have the positive connotation. It was just, you know, the king, he's of a type. And you know the type, and he fits it. So. So we definitely do this. And there's an idea that at least goes back to Shakespeare. So I'm sure much, much, much farther back, too. An advantage of this model theoretic approach is that it accommodate, accommodates an edifying wedding of interpretivism with dispositionalism after a long, sometimes uneasy courtship. Dispositionalists about mental phenomenon hold that it comprises propensities to behave, think, and feel in particular manners. For instance, dispositional, dispositionalism about belief is the view that to believe is to have an appropriate pattern of behavioral, cognitive, and phenomenal dispositions. Dispositionalists rightly argue that folk psychological interpreters model beliefs as comprising patterns of dispositions. Thus, sufficiently fitting a folk psychological model is tantamount to being disposed to act, react, think, and feel accordingly. Excuse me. And model theoretic interpreters are ipso facto dispositionalists. To be aptly interpretable as believing and therefore per in per interpretivism to believe is to possess a pattern of dispositions that a folk psychological model associates with the belief in question. So yeah, so if you say you know the, so that type of person, they have a disposition to do certain things because that, that's of their type. And you could also say um, they are that they are model, th you're interpreting them model theoretically uh, 
it, with reference to the type of person that they are. So that's the type of person they are. You're modeling them according to that type of person, and that type of person has a disposition. Okie dokie. Unlike quasi Moldarian view dismissed by Pozlyko, this view is a genuine version of interpretivism according to which attitudes are metaphysically dependent on interpretation. For the model theoretic interpretivist, possessing dispositions is never in and of itself sufficient for possessing an attitude. A pattern of dispositions metaphysically emerges as an attitude only in relation to a pattern detector's model. No actual judgment need take place, but neither does possibly, possible possible ascribability <laughs> this like these two words together i'm just not processing right but neither does possible ascribability suffice instead an actual interpreter must have an actual working con conception of what folks who possess the attitude in question are like so in some sense you need to have an idea that the person could be real but you don't actually need to have it happen that someone does make such a judgment like you have to have like uh so it's like you need to believe that somebody would actually believe that so that's kind of a funky thing maybe this is more about you than it does about other people though to return to our case george's lack of belief does not emerge relative to nadia's erroneous judgment about what he believes it emerges relative to nadia's model of somebody who believes in the wrongness of eating meat George's beliefs are model dependent, not judgment dependent, and model dependence leaves ample room for error. To wit, Nadia misjudges what George believes because he, she mistakenly infers that he sufficiently fits her model of somebody who believes in the wrongness of eating meat. That model, on which the model belief metaphysically depends, centrally includes the dispositions to refrain from eating meat, even when alone, and to be sincere in decrying factory farming. George lacks those dispositions and thus does not sufficiently fit Nadia's model, and thus does not believe. Nadia's judgment that he does believe, which is based in, on misleading evidence about George's propensities, is irrelevant when it comes to metaphysical dependence. Much more needs to be said in exposition and defense of this model theoretic variety of interpretivism. I argue for it at greater length elsewhere. Here, I aim aim only to assert that it is a genuine version of interpretivism since it relativizes folk psychological attitudes to interpretive schemes, and that it does so without falling prey to either Horn of Burns' dilemma. Therefore, an oft-neglected lesson to be drawn regarding how to go about studying the manifest studying the manifest image. Inquirers who wish to understand the mind-dependent features of the world, including the interpretation-dependent features of minds themselves, must take, it, must take into account the various complex and contingent mechanics of mind dependence. Pazlyko demonstrates that if a philosopher is dedicated to constructing a pure speculative metaphysics of the objects of folk psychology without relying on scientifically informed theory of folk psychology itself, then interpret Activism appears hopeless, so much the worse for purity in metaphysics. Okie dokie. So this was a fun thing. Again, the question was, why are we appealing to folk psychology? And it looks like the uh, person that this author, the people that this author is uh, arguing against, may have tripped themselves up on folk psychology. The author, I don't think, needs folk psychology for most of their uh, work here. You say, look, okay, so we have different ways of interpreting how people are, and there's this model version, and there's the disposition version, and they're in that area. And they say, look, the folk psychological model, the model theoretic approach, which they say is what folk psychology actually is doing, that is what works the best. Okay, so they're not actually appealing to the folk psychology they're saying the folk psychology is normative to, to what their metaphysics i mean i think they're trying to kind of have it both ways i'm not sure but that's okay either way it says look this is the right way to go and either the folk psychology is following that or the folk, folk psychology should be following it because it's the right way to go so i'm not 100 percent on the uh, normative force of their argument here like is it really going from the folk psychology to the metaphysics or the metaphysics to the folk psychology it doesn't actually matter for their argument because their argument is saying look this is the right way to go either way um because as i was uh, pointing out up here it's like there's a lot of variation in all this stuff and so 
to draw normative conclusions when there is so much variation is kind of difficult. Still, they are arguing that, okay, look, we can make mistakes, but our mistakes are not critical because it's just their mistakes in how our models fit the world. That's a fine way to go because like any other models that fit the world, be it physics, uh, sociology, it's like some philosophy, anything, um, it's not perfect. You know, that's cool. So we get it right sometimes and we get it wrong sometimes and then, you know, we adjust our model and then hopefully the model is better. And that's just kind of how uh, we learn about stuff. Go, you go test it. So you test the model. Okay, so... Uh, let's see, what else is there to say? Um, just a quick note on, do I know about this stuff? Not really. Do I know about, like... I have some understanding of, like, modeling in uh, philosophy of science. Like, what's the point there? And that's kind of where the uh, my comments are coming from. Like, how are we actually treating the models here? And what is it to sufficiently fit a model? I mean, you don't even need it to be folk psychology. It's just any sort of worldly thing fit one of our models. Because any model is an abstraction. And what's it mean for the world to fit an abstraction? Well, that gets very, very... Uh, ugly very fast if you're trying to figure that out because you know the only actual model of the world is the actual world anything else is some sort of uh, I mean we're trying to sell you something at that point <laughs> to paraphrase the old joke um, it, like any model is trying to sell you on a particular way of understanding the world and so that's kind of what's going on here the author is trying to sell you on their metaphysics um, and how you interpret that um so, I mean, as is all philosophy, this is not a uh, criticism of the author, of course. Uh, let's see, what else is there to say? So, what do I know about this stuff? Not a ton about this. Um, I'm, I uh, have avoided folk psychology in the talk for a good while at this point. Um, do I know something about the philosophy of science and talking about model theoretic views? Yes, I do know something about that. Um, so, that's why... I, I think this is a nice paper because it does a good job of presenting a model theoretic view and the model theoretic view is very good for all the reasons that the author was uh, describing here really. It's like it, it does, you don't fall on like these sort of dilemmas of being too perfect or um, what was the other problem? Um, needing a like specific kind of interpreter. Uh, so yeah. Yeah, is it related to multiple social ontological stuff? I think they were talking about in the beginning. I don't know if you were here for that. Um, where they were talking about... Let's see if we can find it real quick. Um, I'm not sure. Where was that? I don't think it was talking about... They were talking about... Oh, yeah, yeah where was that? Uh, right at the top. Or was that one of the other papers I was reading? Yeah, yeah, no, no. That was one of the other papers I was going to read was actually on that. So I'm getting myself confused. I don't think it's about multiple social ontological stuff. It's really the question is, how do you understand folk psychology? What is folk psychology? And um, that sort of things. Like, how do we, like, how do people just understand what's going on in our own psychology? And there's multiple ways of doing it. Um, so yeah, so we've got this sort of interpretivism that relativizes to actual folk psychological practices. See, this is the actual psychological practi practices. Then you have a question of like what actually is uh, counts as a folk psychological practice, and then you'll get in yourself into maybe social ontology once you get onto that, because then you're talking about what groups of people are actually talking about in their heads. And that gets gets uh, difficult and complicated. But yeah, there was a different paper I was going to read. That was on um, social ontology. And I was like, oh, okay, we could talk about that. But no, that was a different paper. <sighs> See, perhaps most saliently, ascribers almost always lack complete evidence about whether somebody sufficiently fits their conception as account as having an attitude. Yeah. yeah, well, please do, of course, watch it. I'm just trying to pick out anything else that might be interesting. You don't see this sort of sense. 
Perhaps most saliently, ascribers almost always lack complete evidence about whether somebody sufficiently fits their conception to count as having the attitude. And it doesn't, you don't, and what I want to say here is this last little bit, having the blank, really, it's not the attitude. It could be anything. And that's one of the interesting things about talking about models and how we understand the world. How do we know the world fits the model? And then how do we know that any particular instance is an instance of that uh, thing? So, yeah. Okay. And so there's just a, applying this to attitudes also. Okay, I think that's all I have to say at the moment. Um, I do feel bad for Nadia. She got fooled by George. Um, I hope she didn't give him a raise or something for just being arbitrarily uh, vegetarian in her presence. Um... But yeah. Okay. So. Yeah, see, in this conclusion again, you have to destroy the must account for the various mechani mechanics of mind dependence. And this is where the model theoretic stuff comes in. All right. So that's it for now. And uh, I will see you soon. I'm sorry I haven't been broadcasting as much, but. I'm working really hard on the Minesweeper, to tell you the truth. And uh, once that gets done, then I'll be streaming plenty of Minesweeper and more philosophy. So I think uh, I'll see you soon, and I hope everyone has a good night, and stay safe out there, everyone. Bye-bye. Okie-doke. <laughs>